Welcome to NOAA Science Camp Virtual Programming. My name is Lisa Hebruki Raring, and I'm going to be moderating today's webinar. These webinars are a collaborative effort by NOAA Fisheries Alaska Fisheries Science Center, where I work, Washington Sea Grant, and NOAA Fisheries Northwest Fisheries Science Center. NOAA Science Camp is a hands-on summer science program that in other years is held in person at our NOAA Western Regional Center in Seattle and is designed to show you how NOAA science touches your everyday life and how NOAA offices work together to address environmental issues. Since this summer we're online, we wanted to get to put together a series of webinars and activities to give you a look at NOAA's work on particular topics and how our scientists conduct research. The webinars this week are designed to help you get to know about NOAA's work on climate change, both the physical aspects of monitoring carbon and why it's important, which, is, which was our Tuesday webinar, and the social aspects of looking at the impacts of climate change on communities, which is today's webinar. NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, studies the ocean and the atmosphere and where the two meet, from weather to ocean to the animals that live around us. All of our speakers work for some part of NOAA or work in partnership with NOAA. We hope this gives you a sneak peek at some different career paths you might be interested in. Today, we're introducing you to Sarah Wise, who works for NOAA Fisheries Alaska Fisheries Science Center in Seattle, Washington. While we'll be talking about NOAA's role in research and stewardship, we want to recognize that we're all coming to you from the traditional lands of Native communities who have substantial Indigenous knowledge and much to share with us. Sarah works in Alaska coastal communities, which are the traditional homelands of the Inupiat, Yupiat, Siberian Yupiat people, the Nungah, Alifik, Sipiak, Iyak, Klinkit, Haida, and Simshin. We'd like to acknowledge that Sarah is presenting from and we're hosting the webinar from the traditional lands of the first people of Seattle, the Duwamish people past and present. A few guidelines before I hand you over to Sarah. You're all muted because we have a lot of people on the line and we want to make sure everyone can hear our speaker. However, there's a box where you can write questions and we encourage you to ask them. Um, I'll be keeping track of the questions for our speaker behind the scenes. So please put the questions in as soon as they occur to you and then we'll stop every now and again to take a couple of questions. We may not get to all of our questions, but we'll try to answer as many as we can. All right, I'll hand it over to Sarah to introduce herself. Hi, good morning. Uh, my name is Sarah Wise, and I'm an anthropologist with the Alaska Fishery Science Center. I'm based here in Seattle, Washington, but I do all my work in Alaska, and I've worked there for about four years now. I'm still learning a ton about the Science Center and all the work that's done there. So today I want to talk a bit about my work as an anthropologist and some of the work I'm doing on the impacts of climate change, on people and communities. And I'm mostly gonna talk about the communities that I've worked with, but I want you all to think about ways in which climate change may have be or have affected your own communities. And then we can spend some time at the end um, to explore that a bit together. So today there are four sections to my talk. First, I wanna talk a bit about the field of anthropology and fisheries. And then I'm gonna give an overview of climate change and some of the science involved in measuring it. And third, I wanna show some of the examples of climate impacts for communities I've worked in. And finally, the fourth section will allow for some time to talk about your own communities and some changes you may have observed. So what is an anthropologist? And you all may know that the Alaska Fishery Science Center is a federal research institution that conducts fishery science. And some of you may know what an anthropologist is, but I'm going to start with a definition. When you all think of anthropology, some you may think about Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom. And this is, um, this is, you're really right. Indiana may be the most famous anthropologist at this point. And there's a picture of me, in fact, um, sort of in the uh, having adventures, traveling in distant lands and um, doing, doing things that I wouldn't normally necessarily do, just like Indiana Jones. But there's actually so much more to anthropology. There's four fields, main fields of anthropology. So very broadly, anthropology is the study of human societies, their culture and their development. So cultural anthropology, which is um, here on the top, and I think you can see my, my cursor there, is the study of culture or the customs, arts, institutions, and achievements of, of a particular group. Then there is, and that's 
that's what I am. And then there's archaeology, which is what Indiana Jones does. And that's a person who studies human history and prehistory through the excavation of sites and the analysis of artifacts and other physical remains. So really the study of very, very old people. There's also linguistic anthropology, and that's the study of language and how it shapes our thinking. And the fourth field is physical anthropology, which includes uh, subfields like forensic anthropology, which you may be familiar with the TV shows uh, CSI or Bones. And this also includes primatology, which is the study of non-human primates like James et al. So as you can see, it's it's really um, a pretty broad, expansive field, and we can do a lot within that field. Again, I'm a cultural anthropologist, and I'm one who studies the uh, climate change, coastal communities, and knowledge um, uh, around the world. So how did I become an anthropologist? And I did love Jane Goodall, and I watched all the Indiana movies, but it, I took a really windy path getting here. Mostly, I tried new things every chance I got. I volunteered at wildlife rehabilitation centers and vet clinics. I was part of a sales, sailing science program where I studied ocean temperatures and plastics across the Atlantic Ocean. I did an internship at the American Museum of Natural History. Whoops, sorry about that. And uh, studying biodiversity. And I worked at the Woodland Park Zoo here in Seattle for several years starting as a volunteer and working my way into a permanent position. And in fact, it was at the zoo that I started to get more and more involved in international conservation programs for certain species, and I learned about the threats they face. So I realized I wanted to go back to school and learn more about environmental management and conservation. And so I went back to get my master's in environmental policy and learn how to translate science into management. Um, there I studied uh, at the Bard Center for Environmental Policy. I studied climate science and biology and resource economics and even how to talk to the press. But I soon realized that the program did not teach us anything about people. And at the same time, I read articles about by a fishery anthropologist who put humans and community right at the center of fisheries management. And I realized I needed to go back to school again. So a pretty windy path. Uh, I did my undergraduate college in literature, then my master's in environmental policy, and then I moved on to Rutgers University to get a PhD in anthropology. If I was to say what the most important thing about all of this was, it would be mentors. I had many along the way, and I still do. At Rutgers, I was lucky enough to meet and work with Dr. Bonnie McKay, and she's the same fisheries anthropologist who wrote those wonderful papers on people and community, and she taught me so much, not just about how to do the science, but how to talk to all kinds of people with confidence and how to um, ask really hard questions, how to feel more comfortable speaking up, um, how to be generous and kind with my feedback, and also how to take really strong but constructive criticism. And I'm still learning from her. So I would say, first and foremost, um, really keep an eye out for those people in your life who can and who are willing to mentor you and hold on to them because they will teach you the really important stuff. So I think now we have a little time for questions from that section. Okay, Sarah, um, we did have a question about um, one of the pictures on one of your first slides showed, uh, I think it might've been you um, with, with an animal that had white and black stripes. So I think yes. it was, yes. And somebody was wondering what so there was that the woodland park one with the the lemurs and then the one previous to that i think had um oh. one in the lower corner that had white and black stripes so they were wondering what kind of animal was that so this first one um was a tiger that, that both were actually at the woodland park zoo so this tiger was getting a dental and uh he was at the veterinary clinic that is on zoo grounds and there's a whole veterinary staff and while I was a zookeeper there 
I took care of the animals who came in who were sick and who maybe had to sit through quarantine um, or they were recovering from things like dental. So that's a picture from, from that. And then other one, they are ringtail lemurs. Um, and I took care of the lemurs um, as well as the red rough lemurs. I don't have a picture of that. And, um, and yeah, those are ringtail lemurs. And there was another question of what kind of background do you need to become a zookeeper? Ah, well, I think that um, I think that that really depends on where you are and 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 the zoos that are in your area. So the Woodland Park Zoo is um, it's a pretty big um, and it's internationally uh, connected, and so they but they have a really strong volunteer program. So a lot of the zookeepers. Um, that there's actually zookeeping science degrees that you can get in undergraduate degree, biology, zoology, um, those kind of degrees really set you up because um, as a zookeeper, you need to really know how animals behave and, and how, um, and what their basic needs are because you're on the front line of really detecting if one's sick or injured or if maybe, someone in the group, like the ringtail lemurs, there was a female that was getting kind of picked on. And so we had to figure out strategies to make it so that um, they could get along better as a group. And so that's one of the things I loved about that job is I had to always think on my feet. But I would say um, as to volunteer at a zoo, you just need the interest. They do have some age requirements um, and a willingness to clean up a lot of poop um because that's where you start but um and then and moving up then getting um the degrees that kind of support the skills they're looking for great and one more question before we move on to the next um section was that you said that you tried a lot of new things um to figure out what exactly you were interested in but um the question was how did you figure out what exactly sparked your interest because it seemed like you tried a lot of different things yeah, that's a great question. And I think I'm just kind of a curious person because really, um, I, 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 if it's new, I'm willing to try it. And I had, I'd never been sailing before. And um, I did like a small, you know, little day sailing stuff. I didn't know what I was doing at all. And, uh, but it sounded exciting. And I knew it had a part to it where I could be doing some work with the ocean and learning more about the ocean. And so I, um, I tried it. And what I always said to myself is, if I don't like it, it's kind of like food, right? You try it once. If you don't like it, you don't necessarily have to eat it again. But it's maybe worth trying to see what you really love. And the other, um, so another example of that would be an anthropology degree. I went to get my PhD in anthropology really because of some of the questions I had, not because I knew anything about anthropology. And I wasn't sure if I would like it. And um, and it was a pretty big commitment to jump into something like that. But I, I did think that uh, some of the work that led up to that was really um, driving some, some curiosities that I had that I just figured I'd explore. Great. One quick question before we move on, and um, Michelle was wondering, where is the Museum of Natural History? That is in New York City, so Manhattan, right in the right by Central Park. And if you ever have the chance to go, it is a fantastic museum. Great. Well, um, shall we move on to our next section? I know you have a lot to share with us. Sure. Yeah. Let's let me scroll forward. Okay. So in this section, I want to talk a little bit about climate change, and I'm sure you've heard a lot about it already. So I'm really going to go over it pretty briefly, but if you have more questions, we can cover those at the end. Um, but first, I want to make sure we have some terms. Um, we're clear on, on what we're talking about. So climate change is a change in the usual weather that's found in a place. Uh, 
And this could be a change in how much rain a place usually gets in a year, or it could be change in the usual temperature um, over a month or a season that a place gets. And then you may also have heard the term global warming, which is related, but that term refers to the general increase in the Earth's average temperature over time, caused by the presence of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere which causes changes in climate patterns across the globe. So that's where they connect. So we're seeing a lot of changes in the weather across the globe. And there's a general increase in the Earth's average temperature over time. And this is affecting things around us. And some of those things are very high profile. You may have heard them in the news. And some things um, we may not necessarily notice because they're small changes, but over time they add up. So things you may have heard about um, in the news, like sea level rise, and you can see on this graphic, it lists some of these, um, some of these impacts. Sea level rise, uh, general warmer temperatures uh, on Earth, warmer oceans, and um, related to that would be stronger and more frequent storms. So hurricanes and that, and um, um, cyclones and that sort of thing. So scientists at the Alaska Fishery Science Center spend a lot of time studying um, climate change. And they study climate change by looking at ocean temperatures and sediment cores um, from permafrost in, in Alaska or ice cores and looking at changes over time. They look at the changes in the amount and the health and the location of marine species like whales and walrus and, and cod and pollock. And scientists take measurements of these things. So I just want to go over a little bit of what this might look like. And here we can see on the global climate dashboard, um, which I believe Lisa will share that link with you all, because I actually um, I don't have that right up here. But it, it tells uh, you can explore all the variables of, that have to do with climate change um, and really look at some of the changes over time. So this is from about 1980 to 2015. And this is measuring the sea level rise globally um, throughout the, um, during that time frame. Actually, this one is about since 1993. So you can see the line here is steadily going up and it's getting higher, meaning the level of the sea is rising. Um, and you can see some of the impacts that we may see in the news or in certain stories, um, like this area here in Louisiana was flooded and is continuing to be flooded um, when there's storms and other impacts, uh, which is causing people to have to move or um, maybe move during certain seasons. So it's having real impacts on people. Another example is, um, the average global temperature. So things, temperatures are increasing around the globe. This is leading to a lot of things we're hearing about in the news right now, like wildfires, things are getting drier, um, which is um, increasing the risk of wildfires. But you can see this measurement, the scientific measurement of the Earth's surface. And you can see the bars here, oops, sorry about that. The bars here are um, steadily increasing over, um, the same time period. So about 1980 up to 2015, you can see an increase in um, rising temperatures. Um, another thing we may have heard of is sea me ice melting, and um, that is related to the oceans getting warmer. And so scientists um, and this is something that Alaska Fishery Science Center is really active in measuring the Arctic sea ice and um, oh, Sarah, I think we lost your 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 um, audio. Can you hear me? I think we have lost Sarah. I'm going to see whether she can get off and get back on again. So, um, let's see. Sorry, can any can you all hear yep. me? 
Yeah, oh, I good. can hear you now. Thank you. Yes, now I can hear you. I'm not sure. Did you continue to see my screen? <laughs> yep, we could see your screen. We just lost your audio for a second there. Okay, so, um, so back to Arctic sea ice. Scientists have um, measured the thickness of the ice in the, in the Arctic, um, in Alaska, and have seen that it has decreased since 1980 again, it decreased in thickness over time. And we may, may hear in the news that polar bears are losing their habitats um, and it's having other effects as well. Um, another thing we might hear are um, glaciers are melting and this has to do with um, rising temperatures and other factors. So here is a picture of a glacier from two Oh, Sarah, we just lost your audio again. And the same glacier in 2015. I'm so not Sarah, sure why. Yeah, Sarah, hmm. we're Let losing me... you just a little bit. Uh, we lost you a little bit there, too. Okay. Um, can you hear me? Yep, I can hear you okay. fine. Let me try it without the headset. I'm not sure if that's causing complications. Okay. Um, so that same glacier in 2015, and you can see it looks very, very different. And again, this is a measurement, a scientific measurement on um, the thickness of 30 well-studied, average of 30 well-studied glaciers across the globe. And you can see the thickness is decreasing over time. So these are some visual images coupled um, along with the scientific measurements um, to start to see those changes. And finally, um, one other measurement is um, the uh, ocean heat is increasing. Sorry, can you hear me? I just got yeah, your text. I think okay. that was my previous text. Okay. Um, so ocean heat is increasing and that leads to more storms and stronger storms. So this is a picture of three hurricanes crossing over the Bahamas. And um, I will be talking about the Bahamas in a little bit. So keep that image in mind. And you can see here the scientific measurement of the increase in the warmth of the ocean over time. So just to give you a sense of how some of these um, some of these impacts that people are talking about, how science measures some of these things. So as an anthropologist, what I do when I when I look at um, climate change over time is I talk to a whole lot of people. I look at the human experience and I look at how some of these changes that we just talked about, that I just mentioned, are affecting humans and people um, in our communities that we live and around the world. So this is an example of our team. We're talking with Connie Timmerman in Dillingham, Alaska about climate change over her lifetime and how things, um, how things are different now for her and her kids and her grandkids. So any questions about this section and climate change? And I'll just leave this picture up so you have something to look at. Okay, so one of the questions was that um, you had mentioned um, a lot of different measurements. And so how do you measure the impact on communities? And maybe you'll be talking about this in your next section. That is a great question. And there's, um, there's no one answer to that because there's a lot of different ways to do it. Um, you can do it with some of it with numbers and you can do some of it so quantitatively with numbers and you can do it with um, words and feelings and emotions and that would be more qualitative. So um, there's really a lot of methods and it all depends on what the questions that you're asking have to do with. So if you're interested in um, what pe how people feel about climate change, what are some of the changes that they're experiencing? What we did in this project 
is we interviewed a lot of people. We interviewed um, in our first phase about 20 people. And these interviews lasted a long time, maybe an hour or two hours. And then we transcribed all of their words and we asked them questions about changes and what they ate and what their grandchildren ate and, and um, how, how they learned to fish and things like this. And then we wrote down, we tapped, um, typed all of their answers out and we analyzed their answers um, into and organized into different categories about um, family networks and the importance of family and then about food and and what foods were valuable and in how people were, what changes they may have seen and how they're dealing with those changes. So really a whole lot of organizing. And then once you get to that section, you can start making connections. So that's, that's with this project. And I can talk more about that when I talk about um, some of the other work as well. Okay, that sounds good. Great. Thank you so much, Sarah. Let's get into our next section. And I can hear a little bit of an echo. So I'm wondering whether when I'm talking, you might be able to mute yourself. Sorry, yes, I can do. Okay, so now you can unmute yourself and get started with the next section again. Okay. All right, so third section, I'm going to talk about climate change and people. And to explore these questions, I'm going to talk about my own work in two very different places. Both are island communities, and both are experiencing lots of changes, but they're in really different parts of the world. And these are, this is the Bahamas on the, on the left here, and then St. Lawrence Island, Alaska on the right. So if you look at the map, if you look at the map and you can see uh, North America here and Alaska way up in the top left side, St. Lawrence Island is off the coast of Alaska, almost closer to really to Russia than it is to Alaska. Really pretty isolated up in the Northern Bering Sea. And then the Bahamas is down here in the lower right side off the coast of Florida. So very, very different places, but let's see, um, um, as we dive into this, we can see how um, some of these places share some similarities. So the Bahamas is a group of low-lying islands, about 700 in total. Only 17 of them are have people on them but it's a very big spread out space and it's surrounded by shallow warm seas. And the country's population is about 33,380,000 3, people, which is roughly if you compare half the population of Seattle. So over this very broad, mostly ocean space, um, there's, there's not many people. And two thirds of that population is in the capital city of Nassau, which is here on the map, this bit, this island here. These are small island communities, um, sometimes only, you know, maybe 80 or 40, 40 to 80 people, and some are much bigger. And they're entirely dependent on the ocean for survival, with some, um, some dependence on anything that can be flown in. So what they fish for, what they uh, grow, that is primarily what people depend on. And that's for food, for transportation, and for a way of life. So what we did in 2000, um, I first traveled to the Bahamas nearly 20 years ago to talk to people about their experiences with the ocean and how it's changed in their lifetime. And at that time, the word climate change wasn't even really familiar to some people in the Bahamas. They talked a lot about storms and hurricanes and these events that um, they'd experienced, but climate change as a concept was kind of a new idea. At that. So I've returned since then nearly every year to ask some of these same questions about fishing and marine conservation and, and catching crab and life on the island. And I've talked to grandparents and, and grandchildren and some of the people that 
where children, when I first arrived, are now telling me about the changes they've seen in their lifetimes as young adults. So it's been really an interesting process, being able to continue to go back. And now climate change is very, very much a topic that people know a lot about and talk a lot about. So some of the things that we found and, um, and that people have noticed in the Bahamas is that there are generally warmer oceans uh, around the islands and that fish are moving. Some fish are smaller and they don't return to the same areas to spawn. They've moved their spawning locations and instead of moving farther out, um, I mean, they instead they have moved farther out or into deeper waters. There are more invasive species or species that come from other places and disrupt the system. And this is an example here on the bottom left of the lionfish that's moved into the area. I think it was first seen in 2005 and now they are everywhere. And there are fewer conch and grouper. Conch is a shellfish species and grouper is a large um, fish that people love to eat. And these are species that are native to the area and there, there are not nearly as many of them now. The storms are stronger and they come more often and they do more damage. And this has led to erosion and property damage and salt water in their freshwater wells and has had a lot of impacts in their daily life. People are worried about getting enough food and water and traditional foods like conch and grouper are getting smaller and harder to get. So people are having to buy more store-bought items rather than eating what they grow or catch from the sea. So moving over to St. Lawrence Island in Alaska, again, this is an island community and um, it's surrounded by the deep, cold, northern Bering Sea. In the winter, sea ice surrounds the whole island. The population on the whole island is divided over two communities and is about 1,300 people. So, um, so again, small, small communities. And like the Bahamas, the people who live there are highly dependent on the ocean for daily life. So in 2019, I was part of a team a research project um, conducted by a University of Alaska graduate student, Janelle Larson, who's now Dr. Larson. And she's a marine biologist who looks at walrus reproduction, but she was really interested having gone to St. Lawrence Island several times and seen some changes with walrus. She was interested in learning how those changes were affecting the people of St. Lawrence Island who rely on walrus for food and art and culture. So she returned to the island and talked with people and we designed a project um, to get at some of the changes people have been experiencing. At first, mostly she talked just with walrus hunters, but then it became really clear that it was important to talk in a much broader group of people, including grandmothers and teachers and the librarian and, and the people who fish and artists. Um, and really everyone involved in the community because everybody was really feeling some changes in their environment. And what these interviews showed us was that people in St. Lawrence Island have noticed a lot of changes. There's a reduced um, amount of sea ice every year, less and less, and it's thinner. And this makes it harder to catch walrus and a higher risk when they do go out. Hunters are traveling farther away from the island in open water, and some have started night hunting, which is very, very new and a little bit risky. And it's more difficult to catch crab, which is um, an important subsistence species. There have been changes to marine species, again, more invasive species like the Hanasaki crab. Fish from the, that are more in the south are coming northward like pollock and cod are now, are now common in the area. There's increased storms and rough seas, which is leading to erosion and higher winds on the communities, which is causing some damage and, and breaking up the thin ice. And people are worried about getting enough food. There's shifts in diet away from traditional foods and toward more store-bought items. So what we're seeing is similar ish, um, impacts from climate change, 
but in very, very different areas. And that's a picture of Dr. Larson there who did the field research. So any questions on that section? So Sarah, thank you for that summary. That was really interesting. Um, one of the questions was that um, it seems like a lot of the they were they the speaker was surprised that um, there were such similar impacts in the Bahamas and in at Saint Lawrence Island up in Alaska, and was wondering is this common for other areas where um, scientists anthropologists are looking at climate change impacts on communities? Yeah, I mean I think that. In some ways, each place is very different. So there's going to be um, different impacts in areas as well. But I think some of the changes that people are experiencing um, are can be in many locations, like the changes in the food you eat or the, the fish you catch. Um, these are changes and people aren't used to you. Know, for instance, in St. Lawrence Island, people have been living and fishing and hunting there for centuries upon centuries. And these, um, these things that um, are changing very quickly. And so there is this um, trying to get used to a new environment very, very quickly. And that's that sort of struggle into seeing what species are there, that it can be shared across the globe. So in that way, there's a lot of similarities. Oceans are getting warmer across the globe. Air temperatures are getting warmer across the globe. So there's a lot of shared experience there, but the details and the specifics of those um, local sites, uh, those can be very individual and, and specific to a community as well. Great. And um, speaking of specific um, differences, um, Michelle was wondering how do people eat conch in um, the Bahamas? I should have put a picture up. <laughs> um, so a lot of different ways. Traditionally, uh, many people have dried it and then it's, it's good throughout the year. And you could just put it in soups and stews and it rehydrates and, and it's a great source of protein. One of the best ways to eat it and um, what, what people tend to do is make what is called conch salad, which you basically just pull it out of the shell, you chop it up, you put some herbs and some vegetables in there, lots of lemon juice, and you eat it like that. It's like a ceviche, and it's quite good that way. It sounds like you've eaten some of, the, some of those dishes yourself. I, did you hear my mouth water a little bit? Yes, it is. I have eaten quite a bit of conch. Although now it's um, a little, it's harder to find. I've seen those changes just in the time I've been. Okay, and then um, Weston had some a question about walruses. Um, are walruses protected by the Marine Mammal Protection Act? I think they were wondering about that because um, you had talked about the community on St. Lawrence Island hunting walrus. Yes, that's a great question. And Lisa, you probably have a really good sense of the details of this, but I'll just say, yes, they are, they are protected, but there are some um, agreements in place with tribes that have traditionally, and native communities that have traditionally hunted walrus. And so they're allowed to capture walrus for subsistence, pur subsistence purposes. Um, and I think there are limits to that. There's also a lot of regulatory bodies like the Walrus, a Marine Mammal Commission, um, the Walrus. Lisa, help me out. Do you? <laughs> yes, yeah, sorry. Um, so this is Lisa. Um, yes, the Marine Mammal Protection Act does protect all marine mammals, but there is a specific um, exception in the Marine Mammal Protection Act that allows for Alaska Native communities to um, hunt marine mammals for subsistence, which means for their own personal community use. Um, and part of that is um, what Sarah was alluding to when she was talking about climate change impacts on these communities is that um, because um, a, lo a lot of the, the marine mammal subsistence use is 
um, traditional has been done for thousands of years and also um, allows for um, community food security during the winter seasons because um, if you can imagine the cost of, of um, shipping food from the, the lower 48 states to Alaska, um, even just what things that you would think of um, as normal in a, a, a city grocery store would be quite expensive up in, in Alaska. And I think Sarah might be talking about that a little bit. Um, so, so yes, walruses are protected by the Marine Mammal Protection Act, but um, for Alaska communities who have traditionally hunted walrus or other marine mammals, they are allowed to have a certain number that they can take for subsistence use. Yeah, thanks. And then, um, Sarah, we have one question that what might lead us into our next section here. Um, Otis was wondering, much of the data can feel sad or depressing since it's going in a bad direction for climate change issues. How do you stay hopeful in your work with climate change? That is a fantastic question, and no one's ever asked me that before. Um, and I, I have thought about this a lot. And what's interesting is, and I do talk a little bit about this at the end, but I, I found that when I wasn't really directly involved in talking with people and learning more about it and, and being part of some of the knowledge sharing around these issues, I was a lot more stressed out about it because it can be really overwhelming. These changes are new and they can be scary and definitely overwhelming. Um, but when I start to talk with communities about the things they're doing on the ground with their um, with the kids at the schools and and other youth groups, I realize there's so much hope in there too, and there's so much energy and action and movement that that really helps me put it into perspective. Um, that it kind of brings up the energy of uh, to, to, to be able to in kind of absorb all of this that can be super overwhelming. And I take breaks. I take lots of breaks to, to mentally, to mentally um, rest about these things. So I think that that's a good segue into our next section. So if you'd like to get into your next section, that would be great. Yeah, great. So just I wanted to do a very quick summary about the things that we were seeing in um, both these locations. And basically, this speaks to someone's question as well as uh, they're both experiencing warmer oceans. They're both experiencing pretty dramatic changes in marine species, uh, increased storms and rough seas and people are worried about these changes. And a lot of those worries uh, have to do with about getting enough food and um, making sure that their children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren may have the chance to enjoy the same foods that they grew up enjoying as well. And seeing some shifts in diet away from traditional foods that they have relied on for centuries and um, at St. Lawrence Island for millennia and toward more store-bought items. So I want to just um, move now to a broader question about how climate change is affecting your community and the ways you might be seeing some of these changes um, in, your own, in your own places where you come from. So for those of us in your audience, in our audience, um, if you can think of ways that climate change might be affecting your community, go ahead and type them into your um, comment box or your question box, and we can get an idea of how you see climate change affecting your community. Um, I did see some people talking about this already online, which is um, some folks are talking about wildfires and how wildfires are impacting their communities, both in terms of the fires themselves making people have to evacuate their communities, and also in with respect to the smoke that comes from the wildfires and impacts communities that might not be affected directly by the wildfires, but are directly 
but are affected by the, the air quality that results from the um, wildfires. And so Michelle is talking about sea level rise in Hawaii. Um, Texas is talking about here in Colorado, there have been a lot of wildfires. Chris is also talking about heat waves and forest fires. And here in, in the Pacific Northwest, we had a pretty extreme heat wave a couple of weeks ago. Um, let's see, Chai Ten is talking about how in Seattle, it's usually rainy and moderate, and a week ago it was 106 degrees. So that's pretty extreme there. Um, Veronica and Tanya here in St. Paul Island on the Pribilof Islands. Hi, Veronica and Tanya. Um, they're, they're watching your webinar with a bunch of their youth and um, their students had mentioned that there were fewer seals and seabirds that are coming to the island, um, likely a result from climate change. Um, Wyatt is saying that in Bellevue, Washington, we've been having massive heat waves and Kai is talking about more rainfall affecting his community. So there are a couple of them. And then we have also um, some folks talking about how the warm waters um, make hurricanes more intense. So where hurricanes might not have gotten more intense as they reached landfall, um, I think we've had several, several examples in the last several years of um, hurricanes suddenly strengthening in, in, in severity as they come to landfall, as well as some of the hurricanes just kind of parking themselves over communities and, and creating a lot of problems with increased rainfall and flooding. And uh, Ronan is also saying there's a heat wave in, um, the, in the community. And um, Weston is talking about salmon decline in the Pacific Northwest. And that comes from a, multiple, uh, a number of different um, uh, reasons. I think that there's, there's been um, warmer temperature causes warmer streams, which affects the survivorship of the small salmon, the baby salmon that are going out to sea, but also um, lower food availability in the oceans means that there are fewer adult salmon returning to the streams to spawn. So there's a lot of different impacts there. Paul is saying that in New York City, it got so bad that in super hot conditions, you couldn't breathe outside. So that's pretty intense as well. Um, we also had some folks talking about warming waters in the Great Lakes that are talking that 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 cause greater highs and lows in terms of of uh, water levels. So I think that in Chicago, um, there have been pretty extreme highs and lows in the last, I don't know, ten years. I think they were saying ten years, um, where sometimes the water level is so low that that it that it's hard for water to get through to the river systems. And then in other years, it's so high that um, there's danger of flooding along the shorelines. So there, it seems like there's a lot of different types of, of impacts to communities from climate change. Yeah, definitely. And a lot of those hit home for me as well, because in Seattle, several people mentioned the extreme heat we were all facing. So I sat in the basement. I was lucky enough to be able to work from home and I moved down there and stayed cool. But it was um, it was a challenge for those of us who have lived in Seattle for a while. It was a very big change. So um, I wanted to talk a little bit because I know we mentioned, whoops, I think, um, Sorry about that. Ah, yes, I know we mentioned um, a lot of talk about diet changes and how people are, are buying things at the grocery store rather than going out and hunting or catching their own food. And that may um, not, for, for folks who, you know, live in on the lower 48 and who go to the grocery store and it's fairly convenient and easy and well stocked and relatively um, affordable. I just want to show you some pictures of prices that people have captured from across Alaska. And, um, and so not only does the move away from hunting or catching subsistence foods, what that means for your family and for culture and for the Im important valuable valuable value of meaning and pride of being self-sufficient and eating the foods your parents and grandparents have shared with you.
but it's also unbelievably expensive for these small island communities to buy food and the prices are really mind-blowing so just yesterday i bought a uh, watermelon for 3.99 at the grocery store and you can see here this picture of half a watermelon for 36 almost 37 dollars um Again, bag of Doritos. I think may, I, I actually haven't done that in a while, but maybe a buck fifty, two bucks most. And here's a bag for six dollars. Um, and then feeding your dog is a huge investment. So this is a, a bag of dog food, curing the dog chow for sixty bucks, um, and a, a, a bottle of orange juice for almost $13, uh, which I think maybe would run two to three bucks down in my grocery stores. So th these are really significant impacts to, to families and to, to people um, who may uh, rely on these foods to um, during times of scarcity and do for important um, family connections and then the added cost. So Sarah, um, Tanya and Veronica, Sarah, Tanya and Veronica on um, St. Paul Island in the Pribilof Islands in Alaska was were wondering what year is that milk from because they were looking at the price, and I would imagine also that it would depend where the milk was being sold because in more remote areas of Alaska it would likely be more expensive. Definitely. So yeah, this is sort of across various communities in Alaska. I think that um, I think the uh, watermelon was Kotzebue, and I'm not actually sure off the top of my head about the milk, but these also um, prices have certainly skyrocketed in recent times. So can and actually, um, Tanya is now, you're getting a, a real-time price check right now because she said that our milk right now on the Pribilof Islands is like $10 per half gallon. Wow, so there you go, there you go. Uh, thank you for that because that's that's great data right there. So yeah, I want I just wanted to emphasize that the, this is no small shift for people. Um, okay, so I wanna talk a bit now about um, some of the some of the things that you all can do. And I'm really glad somebody asked the question about how do you not get overwhelmed and, and sad about all of these changes? And I think that's a really important question to think about, but there are lots of things we can do. And kids in particular, youth in particular, have been really active on this globally in the United States and all over the world. So some of the things I just kind of read a bunch and looked at a bunch of websites and made a list that of what of some top things that people have put together that individuals and families and communities can do and that includes speaking up and talking about these things organizing with your friends and your classmates around issues that are really important to you turn off the lights and all the devices in the that you may not be using those small little bits of um, less fuel use actually makes a difference in the long run. Take shorter showers, eat less meat, walk or bike places if you can, and talk to the people around you about saving energy, plant trees, and I'm sure we can all think of um, other, other things we could be doing as well. But I wanted to highlight two um, examples of this. The top one is a picture from a San Francisco middle schooler and it's a program where middle school students um, started to grow what were called super plants because not everyone has the room or access to be planting trees. And so the idea is these very small plants absorb tons of carbon monoxide and produce tons of oxygen. And so while they're small in, in size, they really have a large impact. So they took on this challenge and started to produce these super plants. Um, and to help fight climate change on a, on, on, a, on a very local level and then building that out. And then another example, which is, um, this is an, a UN initiative, so United Nations across the globe, and it's called Climate Science Alliance, and they have a Climate Kids Project. And I put the website there 
And there's all kinds of organized activities on that website. Um, so you can reach out, connect with other kids from all over the world, get organized, swap ideas, and, um, and start to think through some of the challenges that you may be facing in your own community and, and, and think about it you know, across the world that way. And then finally, I, these, I just highlighted some of the movements that are taking place around the world. And um, there's a group called Youth for Climate Action with UNICEF, it's specifically with kids, lots of kids meeting, organizing, networking, and really having a very strong presence with their local governments to say, we need change. Um, and we want to be part of that change. And um, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with Greta Thunberg, the Swedish um, uh, young kid, really, she's very young now, she's older, who, who started the striking for climate change. And she, um, she would sit out with her sign and, 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 and call for climate justice for children. And now she's an international figure. She does a very large lecture circuit talking about um, the importance of taking care of the, the, the earth um, for kids and, and that it really matters. And she has some very great, um, if you look her up, she's got some very great resources for people. And then finally, this third, um, uh, this third organized effort is childrensversusclimatecrisis.org is the website. And it's a group of kids Greta is also part of that group. And from all over the world, I think the youngest when it first started was eight on up to 17. And they have organized locally and connected globally to sue, to, do, to produce a lawsuit on massive um, carbon um, distributors. So uh, polluters basically, and to make their governments change some of the laws and organize to make some changes in their, um, in their places across the globe for a better future. So just to give you some ideas of, of, of the many, many ways you could be involved in, um, in some of this on the local level. And I think that, oh, and the, finally, if we do have a couple minutes, I wanted um, to point you all to this incredibly fun tool. And I didn't have much time to dive into it because, um, online because it, it, you'll go down a rabbit hole and just you want to play around with it a lot. But it's called the Sea Level Rise Viewer. It's a NOAA product tool. And that's the website. You can click on it. And let me see if I can get, um, if I can get it up on this screen. So, oh, and this is Lisa. We have, we have a link to this on our NOAA Science Camp um, web materials and um, yes, I would second Sarah's uh, recommendation and highly encourage you guys to take a look at it because you can look at your own community to see how sea level rise will impact it. And um, you can also look at other communities that you might be interested in visiting someday to see how sea level rise might impact those communities. Yeah, perfect. So that's what it looks like. And just dive in and play around and scroll in. It's kind of like a Google Earth with sea level information. So that's all I have today. Great. Well, thank you so much. We are just about out of time. Um, but I really appreciate all of the the um, the projects that you highlighted and um, ways that people can take action. I put some links to the, um, the, the organizations that you had mentioned into the chat box. And I also had wanted to mention that there um, in Alaska, there's an organization that, that sponsors climate ambassadors. And so that's another way that folks in Alaska can get um, involved. But I think kids all over the, the country can, can look up some of these resources and be able to um, see ways that they can take action. And we've had um, projects where high school students have explored sea level rise impacts to their communities. There was a community in New York, I think, that was doing that. And they took their results to their city, their local city hall, and had a meeting with their um, with the mayor to talk about impacts. And so there are ways that you can locally have an impact on your community and, and raise awareness of, of impacts by climate change. 
So, and I see that Ronan is saying, is there any homework for this class or the previous class? And um, so Ronan, if you are on the NOAA Science Camp um, email list, um, we have been sending out emails with um, links to projects that are related to what these webinars are talking about. So Sarah has been talking about impacts to communities and we have several links on um, the NOAA Science Camp website and through the mailers um, to explore more about the impact of, of climate change and communities. So if you'd like to follow up on that, feel free, or you can email me, lisa.hebrewkeyrearing at noaa.gov. So thank you. It looks like it's we're right at 11 o'clock, so we're, we're right at time. Thank you so much, Sarah, for, for sharing all of this information with us. And um, and thank you to all of our, our um, viewers for coming online. Yes, thanks for having me. It was fun and good luck, everyone. Great. Thanks a lot. All right. So.